Thank you everyone for joining us. Welcome to the latest Duke media briefing on the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm Greg Phillips with Duke Communications. The FDA has granted Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine an emergency authorization for use in 12 to 15 year olds. With us today to discuss this development is Dr. Michael Smith. He is a pediatrician and medical director of the Infectious Diseases Clinic at the Duke Children's Health Center. He studies antibiotic and vaccine use in children and has been involved in the pediatric trials of the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine. Dr. Smith, good morning. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Um, your career has kind of focused on how children are not just little adults when it comes to dosing and medical needs. Can you talk to us a little bit about how this vaccine clinical trial uh, is different or in what ways it's similar to the trials for adults? Yeah, sure. So, so for many pharmaceutical uh, agents, uh, antibiotics and, and, and vaccines, uh, children get the same dose uh, as adults do. And, and in fact, um, for the, the Pfizer vaccine that, that is now FDA, uh, has the FDA emergency use authorization, down to 12, the 12 to 15 year olds did in fact uh, receive the same dose as the adults uh, receive, um, as I received as a, you know, as a physician. Um, however, once we get younger than that, we have to slow things down a little bit and make sure that we have uh, the, the right dose that is safe for younger children and effective for younger children. So uh, what we're doing right now at, at Duke is a, is a smaller trial um, in children um, less than 12 to make sure we find that right dose. Um, and then once we have the right dose, we, we'll be uh, working on the next Pfizer trial, which is a large uh, randomized controlled trial, uh, including kids really down to six months um, with, a, with a smaller dose than, than the adults received. But, um, but for the purposes of getting this vaccine out as soon as possible and in a safe way, um, the, the, the children included in the EUA today, the 12 to 15 year olds did receive the same dose uh, as the adults. Great, thank you very much. Can you, uh, can you tell us about how many uh, 12 to 15 year olds were involved in the trials that resulted in this uh, authorization? Yeah, so there are almost 2,300 children, uh, and it's about a 50-50 split uh, in the trial. Half of those children received a placebo or kind of a dummy injection of, of uh, saline or salt water, and the other 50% uh, received the vaccine. Um, so that's about just over 1,000 in each group. Uh, and of those, we, we enroll just over 100 here at Duke. Gotcha, thank you. You mentioned that the, uh, um, the dose was the same for the 12, 15 year olds as it was for the adults. One of the questions that we've had come in is uh, wondering whether the 12 to 15 year olds that get it should meet some sort of um, weight level because uh, what some parents have worried about if they have children who are considered underweight, does that mean that it will still be safe for them to receive that regular dose? Yeah, so I think there's two questions, uh, in, you know, in there. One is, um, is, is the current dose safe? And is the current dose effective? Uh, it is certainly effective. Uh, and again, uh, some of these, uh, the actual trial data have not been fully released by Pfizer. But when you look at their press release, uh, the important thing to note is that um, of the children who, uh, in the trial, who ultimately had a COVID infection, um, all of them were in the placebo group. Uh, and none were in the vaccine group. So if you got the vaccine in this trial, you did not get COVID. That translates to a vaccine that has 100% efficacy. Now, the second question is um, you know, re regarding the safety. And, and I think given that we're still in a pandemic, my, my recommendation would be that if you, have, if you have a child who's 12 or above, I would go, go ahead and give them the vaccine because it's gonna prevent them uh, from getting the disease. Um, um, in terms of the safety outcomes, again, Pfizer has not publicly released all the data, but, but what they've reported in their press release is that the rates of adverse uh, events, um, so in, in the context of a vaccine trial, the most common things that we're seeing were not surprising to anybody. Uh, it hurts, um, it can be a, a little bit red, your injection site um, can be a little bit swollen, and they reported that the rates uh, of all those adverse events were not different in the 12 to 15 year old group uh, as compared to the 16 to 25 year old group. Those are the data that were previously submitted to the FDA and led to licensure in that group. Now, um, in, in general, the younger you are, the more robust your immune system is, you do have a slight, uh, a slightly more reactogenicity, or it's more likely to be a little bit more sore uh, and maybe a little bit more red and swollen uh, the, the younger you are. But, but, but at this point, there's no reason to not give uh, the vaccine to someone, e even if they're on the smaller side. Absolutely. Thank you for that comprehensive answer. Um, now we'll open it up to questions. Thanks to everyone who submitted questions in advance. Uh, we'll be working through those as we're here. You can also post questions via the Q&A window at any time. If you'd like to ask a question in person, raise your hand in Zoom and we will unmute you when your turn comes around. And if you're calling in by phone, uh, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine. 
Okay, um, so I'm going to come back to, uh, you mentioned that the, uh, the trial found 100% efficacy um, among 12 to 15 year olds. Obviously, the, the, the sample size was relatively small, you know, re relative to the population of children in the world. So would you expect that rate to kind of go down um, once you see millions and millions of children vaccinated? Or is there a chance that this thing is just 100% um, foolproof? I wish I could say that there, if you get this vaccine, there's 0% chance you're going to get infection, but no, right. So as you point out, there's always a confidence interval around zero events. Uh, and, and I suspect that there are going to be, there are going to be people who get this vaccine and, and get COVID. But just as we saw on, uh, you know, in, in the adult population, um, even if the vaccine does not prevent you from getting COVID, um, it's very, very uh, effective at reducing severe disease and reducing hospitalization. So uh, I have no doubt in my mind that this is a good idea. Uh, if you're if you have a 12 to 15 year old at home to give them the vaccine, they're certainly going to be protected from severe disease. There's a very good chance that, you know, we're talking about 98, 98, 99. There's a good chance that that's going to be the ability to prevent any COVID infection. But but to your point, certainly once you get more and more vaccinated people out there, there are going to be some people who, who do get, get infection, but, but it should be attenuated. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Um, one question, and this, this may be too soon, uh, but I want to get your perspective on it. Do we know yet how likely it is that children might need a booster shot? Uh, and if so, do we have any idea how, like, what the interval would be between, uh, between needing the booster? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think uh, it's hard to know because we don't even know for sure if adults are going to need boosters. So I think in terms of that, that general question, um, will, you know, will we as a society need an annual COVID shot like we need an annual flu shot? Um, if, if I had a guess right now, I would probably say yes. Uh, you know, we're seeing variants out there. Now, the good news is, uh, as of right now, most of the variants that are circling in the community uh, seem, seem to uh, have a good response to the vaccine. So if you're vaccinated, you still have some protection against these variants. I think, I think time will tell. And, uh, but however, my best guess, based on what we know today, is yes, we're probably going to need boosters because of the variants out there. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Um, so that being the case, uh, and again, I realize we're speculating here, would, would you expect in that scenario to see a slightly different formulation of the vaccine with different years like we see with the flu vaccine based on what variants are most prevalent in a given year? Uh, yeah, that, that would be the best way to do it. And, and the, you know, the real nice thing about this particular technology is um, again, uh, without getting it, it too much into the, into the microbiology, but, but the, the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine that, that is probably going to follow it um, is, is based on what we call mRNA or messenger RNA, which encodes uh, basically the spike protein, which is the main uh, kind of virulence mechanism or the way that, that, that COVID gets into your body. Um, and with an mRNA vaccine, if you know that there's a different spike protein out there from a variant, you can make a new vaccine uh, that has the slightly different mRNA that's kind of matched um, for whatever variant you're trying to get. So, so the good news about the vaccine is that is definitely feasible. Obviously, it's a little bit more difficult than I just made it out to be, but, but the technology is there. And my, my, you know, again, I don't have the crystal ball to say what's going to happen, but my, my assumption would be that a new uh, vaccine or a new booster would be based on whatever the circulating variant is at the time. Sure, absolutely. That makes sense. Uh, and I realize you're on the clinical side rather than the logistical side, but do you have any sense as to how soon we could start seeing children get vaccinated or 12 to 15 year olds now that it's been approved? Yeah, so that's, a, that's an excellent question. And I will say um, we're all very excited about this. And, and I think uh, we'll be um, shortly having this vaccine into routine clinical practice. But from a regulatory perspective, so the FDA has said, um, you know, uh, the FDA has to has to comment on 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 all therapeutic agents, vaccines, uh, antibiotics. The FDA has allowed this use, uh, this vaccine, to be used in children 12 to 15. The next step is for the CDC to formally recommend it. So tomorrow, uh, there's a, a a meeting of vaccine experts called the ACIP or the Advisory Com Committee on uh, Immunization Practices. They vote. They review the data. And they figure out the best way uh, to roll this vaccine into the uh, into the existing immunization program. Um, there'll be a vote for that tomorrow. Uh, then the vote goes to the director of the CDC, Dr. Walensky, and she will decide whether or not the CDC is formally going to improve, uh, formally going to approve routine use of the vaccine for children. So that vote is scheduled for tomorrow. Uh, depending how much time Dr. Walensky needs, um, it's quite possible that children can receive this vaccine as early as Thursday. 
Wow, that certainly is pretty soon. Uh, and we're going to be interested to see how quickly that happens. Uh, we've got a bunch of questions here in the q and I'm going to race through some of these. Uh, we have one question that says, how might parental consent in states that require it for minors hold the nation back from vaccinating as many people as possible? Since there might be situations in which there are some older children who want to get vaccinated, but maybe can't because their parents won't approve. Do you expect that to be a big a factor moving forward? So I think it's going to depend uh, on the state, um, but uh, certainly there is a precedent for children receiving vaccines uh, independent of parental consent. And I think that's, uh, I'm not a legal expert, so I'll be careful with my answer here, but um, um, that is certainly possible that uh, a, a child can decide to, to, to get this vaccine. And, and the answer to that question will, you know, whether that's legal or not will vary from state to state. Sure, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, uh, another question here says in the FDA's announcement, they said at this time, there are limited data to address whether the vaccine can prevent transmission of the virus from person to person. But health officials are saying that kids should get vaccinated to stop it from spreading to other people. Uh, so the question is, are these two messages contradictory or is it just the FDA being extra cautious? So, um, yeah. So when you when you listen to uh, that statement you just read, I think the question is, um, does the does the lack of evidence um, and, and again transmissibility was not included in the randomized controlled trials initially? There are studies going now looking at transmissibility in adults, and it's, it sure is looking like if you're vaccinated, you're much less likely to, to to transmit this to other people. So I think it's quite reasonable to assume that children can transmit this to adults, and we certainly we've seen that in outbreaks, um, especially uh, when people are not wearing masks. So we know that kids can transmit to adults. Um, so even if the vaccine itself does not produce transmissibility, um, which by the way, I think it does, if a, if a child doesn't get COVID in the first place, they can't ever transmit it. So I don't think those two statements uh, are, are necessarily uh, contradicting each other. The other thing that I would say is um, as a father and a pediatrician, um, I am thrilled that COVID does not tend to cause uh, a severe disease in children as it does in adults. But let's be clear, I mean, kids are affected by this. Uh, certainly some children do get admitted to the hospital. Uh, certainly some, some children you know, do die from this. So uh, the risk is not zero. And I think all of us, um, you know, as whether we're parents or, or grandparents uh, or physicians can clearly see the impact that this pandemic has had on kids and anything we can do to reduce uh, disease incidence uh, and disease transmission in kids to get kind of society back open uh, to the way it was pre-pandemic, I think, I think is useful. So putting that stuff all together, although there's not specific data to show that this vaccine reduces transmission, it, it likely does. And it, it uh, seems to be a good decision to me to, to be vaccinated. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, we have a, a raised hand in the chat. Um, Vanessa Ruffs, uh, we're going to go ahead and unmute you. Please go ahead and ask your question. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Hi, thank you. Um, hopefully you can hear me. Yeah. Um, just a curiosity factor. What is the hazard of having a dose too high for a child? Are we just talking about, you know, unnecessarily strong side effects, you know, with the payoff of the same efficacy or is it something else? No, that's exactly right. Um, it's, it's, it's higher rate of side effects. Um, so specifically fever, specifically the, you know, the, um, the, the fever and the arm pain and the local swelling. Those are the big things. There's no other uh, you know, long-term issues that we're worried about. And the thing is, you might not need as high a dose. So you, know, you could argue to your point, if you needed that high dose, are those, risks worth, you know, are those risks worth taking? But that's not really the question here. The question is, the smaller you are and the younger you are, uh, you probably need less uh, of the antigen or less of the, the mRNA, less of the spike the spike protein to generate immune response. And if we can get to a, a dose that, that, that gets you just as protected uh, as a higher dose, why, you know, wh why take the chance of giving those extra side effects? But yeah, but there's no other kind of long-term side effects or any other uh, things that we're worried about. Thank you. Okay, terrific. Uh, thanks for that. Um, we have another question um, on, a, on a technicality. Uh, that asks, uh, do vaccine providers have to wait for the CDC recommendation tomorrow to start administering the shot to kids 12 to 15? Or could they just proceed without that if they wanted to? Yeah, I mean, you have to you have to really wait, um, because it's not it's not approved for use at this point. Gotcha. So, so the CDC recommendation kind of coupled with the emergency use is kind of like the the, the double barrel thing that people need in order to move forward. Correct. Okay, that makes sense. Um, I want to come back to, to the, the work that you're doing now, which is on the younger children. 
Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning, um, you know, you've, you've said uh, often that your work is based around the fact that uh, children are not just miniature adults, they're very different. So what are some of the considerations when you're doing a vaccine clinical trial in, in much smaller children? Is it just a case of finding the right dose or other, other potential uh, complications that you have to be aware of when testing a vaccine in a much younger population? Yeah, so it, the, you know, the main thing, again, are those two uh, critical outcomes that we think about in vaccine studies. So there's the, the, well, there's three things actually. There's, you know, immunogenicity. Well, actually, I'm going to go in order. So safety is the first thing, right? So you give a child a vaccine. Uh, what, what happens to them? What are the kind of unexpected side effects of the vaccine? And again, based on the data um, that are now out there in the public for this 12 to 15 year old group, uh, just as we saw with the older groups, that's um, some, some pain, some fever, uh, and maybe some swelling. Um, those are the same whether you're a child or, or adult. And the, the second question is uh, immunogenicity. Um, so for all these trials, basically the question is, um, everyone gets a blood draw before they get the vaccine and to see if they have existing antibody uh, you know, or protection against COVID. Um, they get the one dose and they come back for the second dose three weeks later uh, for the Pfizer vaccine, which is what we're talking about. Um, it's very similar, but four weeks later for Moderna, uh, but, but just to give the comparison. Uh, and then a month after that second dose, there's another blood draw to look for um, antibodies to see if there's an immune response to the vaccine. So, um, so that's another important outcome. And then the, the, the final outcome is uh, the efficacy, which is what we talked about, which is what is the incidence of disease? Um, so what proportion of kids in the trial or adults in the trial um, got the disease um, in the uh, vaccine group as compared to the placebo group? And that's how you get the efficacy uh, assessment. So from a scientific perspective, those, those questions uh, are all the same, whether you're looking at adults uh, or children. I think the, the big difference is that um, you know, you need to make trials a little bit more kid friendly. Um, and some of that is written into the protocol, uh, for instance, uh, for the efficacy piece for the, for, the, for the pediatric trial, you don't need the, the so-called tickle your brain um, test uh, to do the nasal swab all the way back uh, to, to detect COVID. We're comfortable using um, um, a swab just in the front of the nose. That's a little bit uh, of an example. Uh, another cool thing that we've done in, in, in our group is, uh, we have uh, a therapy dog uh, who's there to help uh, calm the children, because as you can imagine, um, children are a little bit more anxious about the blood draw um, and, um, and, and the nasal swab testing. So it, it's little things like that just to kind of make things more kid friendly. Um, uh, and, and some things in the protocol are different, but from a pure scientific perspective, really the outcomes are the same. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. And even though shots don't bother me, I wouldn't have minded a therapy dog when I got my vaccination. Um, so another question we've had is a really interesting one. Uh, obviously, we know that the, as you've mentioned, the, the vaccine doesn't stop you necessarily from getting COVID, but does prevent severe disease. We've had a question here wondering about the uh, multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children that has been a complication of COVID. Could, vaccinated, uh, could the vaccination also prevent uh, kids from getting that? Or I guess, is there a chance that it could happen even if they're not getting severe illness, uh, other severe illnesses as a result of uh, being exposed to the virus? Yeah, so, so this, is a, this is a great question and there's not a lot of data uh, about this. So before I give you my opinion about this, this is the, the prime example of why this CDC recommendation that's gonna happen tomorrow is so important. So basically the FDA says, okay, this is approved for use in kids 12 to 15. Now, the CDC folks, can you help us figure out how we're going to roll it out? Um, and um, so this clinical question. So, for instance, uh, if a child has already had MISC, should they be vaccinated or not? That's something that the, that the CDC is going to have to decide, uh, you know, either a yes or a no or kind of a shared decision making. And um, so kind of how you roll this out and provide actionable, useful information for parents and pediatricians is, is part of the CDC guidance that's going to be coming out, uh, you know, tomorrow. Um, so that's, that's, that highlights why this process is so important. Um, now, the question of um, what is the impact of a vaccine on MISC, I think the, the simple answer is um, if you can prevent this disease from happening in the first place, you are going to decrease the likelihood of MISC. Now, obviously, we haven't given this to enough kids at the population level to know for sure what is the population level impact of, of a vaccine on MISC going to be. Presumably, it's going to be decreased. Uh, the other interesting question is, you know, if you've already had COVID, should you be vaccinated? Um, again, this is what we're waiting for what the CDC's recommendation uh, is going to be. 
Uh, certainly for adults currently, the recommendation is if you've had COVID, you should get the vaccine. And I suspect uh, that that's what the CDC is gonna say for children as well. Um, if you've had MISC, should you be vaccinated? Uh, I think that's a difficult question and we don't have data and we'll have to see what the CDC says tomorrow. Sure, absolutely, thank you. Um, returning to this uh, notion, as you mentioned, of the CDC's recommendation tomorrow, we've had one question that points out, apparently at least one healthcare provider announced this morning that they are going ahead and offering the vaccine to the 12, 15 age group. Uh, do, you, do you feel like that's kind of jumping the gun? I mean, uh, what are there any kind of risks to taking that approach? You mean today? Are yes. doing it today? Um, so, so personally, uh, personally, I, I think the vaccine is safe and, and efficacious. As I said before, I'm not a healthcare lawyer, so I, I don't know the implications of giving a vaccine before you have CDC uh, approval and it's officially rec recommended. Um, so I, again, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't go out and, and, and recommend that. But um, from a purely scientific standpoint, it, it's it's probably a safe thing to do. Sure. Um, another logistical question. Uh, it says that since you said that the dosage is the same for 12, 15, 12 to 15 year olds and demand uh, among adults is slipping a bit, at least here in North Carolina, does that mean we shouldn't expect any supply issues once adolescents are you know, fully um, validated to get the vaccine because the supply is there and they can basically use exactly the same supply that we've been using for adults? Yeah, I, th I think for the time being, um, supply is not going to be an issue. I will say um, you know, I'm, an, I'm a pediatric infectious disease doctor, so we do not give vaccines uh, in, well, we do give vaccines in our office, but not routine childhood vaccines. Talking to my friends who are general pediatricians in the area and across the country, there's a lot of demand for this right now. So I, I think for the time being, uh, we shouldn't have a supply issue uh, because there are some, some leftover vaccine, um, uh, you know, out there, out there for adults. Um, but in theory, it, it, beca it could become, a, you know, an issue in the, in the coming weeks. So I think what we're going to see is the parents who want their kids to be vaccinated, I don't think they're going to have an issue this week or next week. It's probably more of a scheduling issue than having the vaccine availability. Um, again, this would be a great problem to have if there's so much demand that we run out of vaccine. But again, there's plenty of vaccine that, that can be made. Um, and um, I don't see this being a problem down the road. Sure, absolutely. And I guess associated with that, um, I suppose, you know, the expectation is, is is very possible that the dose for much, much younger children will be smaller than the dose for adults. Will that, on the manufacturing side, do you know, will that require a big adjustment to start producing smaller doses or is that a fairly simple process? Yeah, it, it's a fairly simple process for them. And again, you know, most vaccines are, are like that. There are some vaccines that, you know, whether you're six months or, or 50 years old, you get the some, you get the same dose. And there are other vaccines uh, where children clearly get different doses. So that's kind of, you know, standard part of the manufacturing process. And, and I think, again, to, uh, you know, to, to be clear, um, what, you know, that this 12 to 15 year old uh, EUA is, is out there. Remember, we haven't even started the large phase two or phase three trials for the younger kids yet. So um, um, as those trials progress, by the time you're getting to an authorization, I don't anticipate, uh, you know, which which at least, again, speaking from what's publicly available, Pfizer has said kind of uh, September-ish. By the time you get to September, I don't anticipate any supply issues for the pediatric um, uh, versions. Sure, thank you. Um, we know obviously that this uh, latest emergency use authorization is for 12 to 15 year olds. Would you expect, you know, assuming that the trials go well, that there would be one emergency use authorization for everybody under 12 or will they need to break it up? Will like kind of babies or newborns require a, a separate trials and a separate um, approval? I, I think it'll probably be piecemeal working down the way that most clinical trials um, and, you know, in children work is you start with the adults, you start with the older adolescents, you go to the younger adolescents and you kind of kind of work your way down. Um, and again, it will, you know, it, again, I don't have the crystal ball. So it'll really depend on how quickly we can find that right dose in each age group that has, you know, enough uh, vaccine antigen, uh, enough of the spike protein to generate immune response without causing too much of the, the local reactions. Um, so my, my best guess would be it's gonna be piecemeal again, but I, I could be wrong, I could be surprised. We, we could get this figured out and have a blanket UA, but I just, I just don't see that happening based on, on what we've seen so far. Sure, absolutely, thank you. Uh, we have another hand raised uh, in the chat. Um, so we'll go ahead and uh, unmute you, Sloan Heffernan, you're unmuted, please go ahead and ask your question. Well, I think we may have uh, lost Sloan, so that's fine. Oh, I'm here. Hi, uh, Dr. Smith. Hi. Thanks for being here. Appreciate it. I know a lot of parents out there are torn about whether or not they 
want to get this vaccine for their child and places like the local local grocery market will offer antibody testing. If you had your child tested and they have the antibody, would you still recommend that they get the vaccine if someone is apprehensive about it? Yeah, so so I, I, I think there's uh, two, two comments I want to make. First, to answer your question directly, at this point, uh, remember, as I said before, the CDC does recommend that if you, uh, if you had prior COVID infection, you should still get vaccinated. So, so kind of following that logic and, and that recommendation from the CDC, the presence of an antibody test really wouldn't sway my decision about recommending a vaccine or not. Um, you know, unfortunately, we don't really know how long COVID antibodies last, and we don't know how well that, that correlates with long-term uh, protection. So for um, the role of an antibody test here in determining whether you should be vaccinated, I, 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 think, is, I, I think is not going to be particularly helpful. Um, your second question about, about parents who are apprehensive about this vaccine, um, you know, I will say it's, it, it's, been, uh, it's been tested in more than 2,000 um, adolescents. Moving, m- moving forward, um, there are lots of people who are interested in getting their children vaccinated. Um, and, and, you know, the, the vaccine safety evaluation does not stop here. There are several uh, kind of longstanding safety mechanisms in place that the CDC has employed. Uh, one is something called VAERS, or the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. That allows anyone who has an adverse event um, after a vaccine to report it to the CDC. Um, the CDC will then in, in investigate these and, and see if there's any uh, kind of concerning side effects uh, after vaccines. The other longstanding safety mechanism is something called CISA, the Clinical Immunization Safety Assessment Program uh, that the CDC runs. Uh, and several of our faculty, uh, myself included here at, at Duke, uh, are one of seven academic centers that, that, that kind of study vaccine adverse events once these, once these vaccines get out there. Um, and I will say there's lots of excellent in, uh, information. The CDC has information uh, for parents of concerns about vaccine. Um, I, I'm, I'm a bit biased because I trained at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, but, uh, but uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia or CHOP, the vaccine, um, uh, the vaccine uh, education center there, the VEC has excellent materials for both parents and teenagers about vaccine safety. So I do think we as a medical community, as a pediatric community, need to, need to get out there and, and respond to parents who have specific questions about vaccine safety. Uh, and that, and that's, that's really the hard part moving forward. I think to, to some extent, um, these trials involve a lot of work. I'm fortunate to be part of a great team here at, at Duke uh, to get these trials done. But now the hard work, is, hard work is convincing parents that the vaccines are safe. And again, for me personally, I have no doubts about that. Um, I wish my children were old enough to get this vaccine. Um, I, I would definitely vaccinate them. So I don't personally have concerns about that. But I think there's a lot of myths and rumors out there that, that we need to, to work on dispelling. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. Uh, we have just about reached time here and you've uh, kind of addressed the question I was going to close with, as you've mentioned, your children are younger than 12 to 15. But I mean, once we reach this point with a vaccine for younger children that's been uh, uh, approved for emergency use, because um, we've had some questions along these lines, is it safe to say that you will be uh, taking your children to get that vaccine once it's approved? Yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, for ethical reasons, you can't enroll children into a trial that you're doing. So I couldn't get them into the current trial, but absolutely, uh, you know, no, no doubt. Uh, once the EUA came through for adults, uh, you know, someone who was in, who, who led the Pfizer trial or co-led the Pfizer trial at Duke, I was one of the first people in line to get the vaccine myself and absolutely going to give it to my kids. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Smith. We will, uh, we will leave it there. Thanks everyone for joining us and for the great questions. Thanks to Dr. Michael Smith for your time and expertise. Duke's holding frequent media briefings on the pandemic and other pressing topics. If you'd like to be notified about other upcoming briefings, please email dukenews at duke.edu, or if you're watching on YouTube, just like and subscribe. In the meantime, please stay well, follow public health guidelines, and get that shot when your turn comes around. Be kind and pet a dog whenever you...